what we do in our own hearts. It could be quite significant. But I want you to really give the Holy Spirit opportunity just to speak to you. Um, to speak to speak personally to you through this little passage we are looking at in Mark chapter 3. Let me just pray. Jesus, Jesus, as we uh, look at your word, as we, as we study and see what happened when you were living on earth and the interactions you had with people, Lord, I pray it wouldn't just be some more head knowledge. But Lord, I pray you would do something deep in our hearts this morning. That's my prayer. Lord, that you would touch us. You would change us. Change our thinking. Change our actions. Change us because we understand deep in our inner being. We love we are here. So, Mark, if you've got Bible, chapter, uh, Mark chapter 3, we're going to read from verse 20. Then, so it's Mark 3, verse 20. Then Jesus went home. Another crowd gathered. We've seen lots of crowds, haven't we, so far in, in Mark's gospel. Another crowd gathered. So, Jesus and his disciples couldn't even eat. And when his family heard about it, they went to get him. They said, He's out of his mind. The experts in Moses' teachings who had come from Jerusalem said, Beelzebub is in him. That's another name for Satan. Beelzebub is in him. And he forces demons out of people with the help of the ruler of demons. Jesus called them together and used this illustration. How can Satan force out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot last. And if a household is divided against itself, that household will not last. So if Satan rebels against himself and is divided, he cannot last. That will be the end of it. No one can go to a strong man's house and steal his property. First, he must tie up the strong man's house. Then he can go through the strong man's house and steal his property. I can guarantee this. People will be forgiven for any sin or curse. But whoever curses the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He's guilty of an everlasting sin. Jesus said this because the experts in Moses' teachings had said that he had an evil spirit. So what's going on here? Well, Jesus has been setting people free, hasn't he? Free from sickness, free from demonic oppression. Um, and, and the experts, the teachers from Jerusalem, were calm and were observing what was going on. And they claimed that Jesus could only be doing those things because he himself was possessed by Satan. That's what they were saying. And Jesus explains that if there's a kingdom that's divided, it's going to fall. It's not going to stand. Right? You can't be an agent of Satan and be getting rid of Satan's work. It wasn't it wouldn't work. So Jesus can't be an agent of Satan. But then at the end of this interaction, he then makes a statement that I think is one of the most important statements we can read. It's in verse 28. It says this, I can guarantee this truth. He will be forgiven any sin or curse. People will be forgiven any sin or curse. Verse 29 goes on, but what, what, whoever curses the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He's guilty of an everlasting sin. So today, we're just going to focus on forgiveness. All right? so it's, a, it's, a, it's a central theme that runs through the whole of Scripture. That we have a forgiving God. And us recognising our need for forgiveness from Jesus. It's a central theme, isn't it? It's right throughout all of Scripture. And then our call that Jesus places on us to forgive others. And this is because forgiveness, I don't know if you've thought about it, but forgiveness is actually spiritual warfare. It's 
spiritually walking. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, this is what Paul writes. If you forgive someone, so do I. Indeed, that what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did in the presence of Christ for your benefit. This concludes verse 11. I don't want Satan to outwit like us. After all, if we are we are not ignorant about Satan's scheme. So forgiveness does something in the battle to do with the work of Satan. You see, Satan wants me and wants you to hold a grudge. That's what he wants. He wants you to think that you should deserve vengeance and revenge. And so he wants you to hold on to the wrongs that are done to you. So that's a spiritual battle. It's a, it's a spiritual battle that we see in the cross. God disarms Satan and the rulers and authorities of this world through the ultimate act of forgiveness. It's amazing. Satan and the demons were put to shame because God chose to forgive. He chose to forgive you and I and every human who's ever lived and will ever live. Those of us turn to him and believe in his son. And although this awesome act of forgiveness was so costly, it cost his son, it dealt a death blow to Satan's hand, us and all the creation. So it's a spiritual battle, this act of forgiveness that we see in the cross. But it's also a spiritual battle, this spiritual warfare for us. When we choose to forgive, when we choose to forgive, Satan is Our forgiveness is offensive because all day, every day, Satan's spending his time. What's he doing? Well, Revelation 12 10, we hear it. He's doing, he's accusing. All day, that's what he does. He accuses us. And our forgiveness breaks, breaks our stronghold. Forgiveness is so hard, isn't it? It's so hard. It fights against all the impulses of our flesh. But when we choose to forgive, we become peaceful. That's what we become. And we can only do this miraculous thing of forgiving others because of the forgiveness demonstrated by Jesus. Only way we can do it. And so, what forgiveness becomes is an outward demonstration of mercy. That's what it becomes. It's an outward demonstration of mercy because, do you know, in um, James 2, uh, James says this No mercy will be shown to those who show no mercy to others. Mercy triumphs over judgment. See, mercy is just like forgiveness. Forgiveness, there's no forgiveness if we don't forgive. There's no mercy unless we show mercy. And mercy demonstrates the food is it demonstrated through an act of forgiveness. I just thought I should say this though, right? When it comes to this idea of forgiveness. Perhaps I'm in a relationship and this person sins against me regularly. Perhaps they're abusive towards me. What should I do? What should I do? I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm looking to forgive. What should I do? Should I forgive? Should I show mercy? Well, yes. It's so hard. It takes our will, our determination to do it. But in forgiving them the wrong that they do to you, they break the chain that binds you. It absolutely breaks it by you choosing to forgive. But I want to say to you, and I just felt I should say this, is that forgiving someone doesn't need to stay in it. If it's a toxic, dangerous relationship. Okay? It doesn't need to stay in it. Yes, forgive. But then you've got to seek help. And, and if that's you, and I don't know why I felt I should do this, but I felt I should just share this point. If that's you and you are in that kind of situation, then can I say, come and talk to Carolyn, Saunders, come talk to me. Um, I'll say I'll safeguard you to the church or who is the the head. Alright? If that's for you. Well 
Well, if they're not sorry. Should I forgive someone if they're not even sorry for what they've done? They don't even realise they've done something to me. Should I forgive them? Yeah. That's what loving your enemies looks like. Isn't it? That's what loving your enemies looks like. Remember to show mercy and you're setting yourself free from the chains that are in the world and in the world. Just for a minute, I want us to think about unforgiveness. Now, if we hold with if we withhold forgiveness, do you know what? We play right into our hands for the enemy. We do. See if my pride or my hurt or my anger, perhaps my bitterness, stops me from forgiving others. Then there's a stark warning that you need to give in Matthew 6. If you forgive the failures of others, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your failures. That's a stark warning, isn't it? If we don't forgive all our sins, against us. And all for fault. But then I was thinking about it, and I was thinking about it in, in my relationship with Tony. Let's say, right, we have a bit of a barney, and a big argument. And, and in the argument, Tanya clearly sins against me. She would be like that. <laughs> she sins against me. And in the, within minutes, I'm dead. And I'm before Jesus. I didn't forgive her. No, I didn't forgive her. I did I want to say to you, from all I can do in the scripture and from people wiser than me, that isn't the issue. Alright? That's not the issue because, you know what, my salvation is not in my forgiveness, it's only my salvation is in Jesus. That's what I'm saying, it's because of Jesus. And, and, and forgiveness is like a fruit that grows in me. And it's growing and it's maturing and it's developing. And I'm getting better at it as I walk with Jesus as I become more and more like Jesus. But it's not about that one moment. Right? It's a lifestyle of forgiveness. It's a lifestyle of to give. And you know what? Sometimes it takes time to forgive. It does. Sometimes it does. And you've got a journey with it. Because sometimes people do feel you can. And they really sin against it. It does take time. But be on the journey. Be on the journey. Because it sets you free. Now we know that Father God is a forgiving God, don't we? And we know that that's good news because Jesus, his whole message was about the love of the Father. And he freely chooses to forgive those that come to him. This is amazing. But here in verse 29, we read something that Jesus said. He says this But whoever curses the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Never be forgiven. He is guilty of your nasty sin. Is there such a thing as an unforgivable sin? If so, what is it? And what should we do in, in, in our lives in view of this fact? Well, we've been looking at the best news ever, haven't we? Which God is. That is amazing news. But the worst news in the world would be that God would never forgive you. That's actually the worst news ever. Can you imagine what that must feel like? That no matter what you do, God's never going to forgive you. You might hear someone say, I'll have to tell them why. You sometimes say, oh, I'll never forgive you. Before they don't forgive you. you can hear them coming. You can hear people say it sometimes. But that's nothing compared to the mind of God that says, you will not forgive you. Nothing compared to that. And when God says never, he really means never. Jesus says that God will never forgive a person who curses or blasphemes against the Holy Spirit. Uh, in Matthew's account, chapter 12, verse 32, he makes it a little bit more precise. This is what he says, uh, Matthew, when he recorded this. Whoever speaks the word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever 
first coincidence the Holy Spirit will not be together in this world for the next. Sinning against the Holy Spirit is a sin that God will not forgive for all eternity. Which means a person's guilt is sealed for all eternity in the world and the next. You see, God is never neutral about sin. He's never neutral about sin. He either forgives it or he punishes it. There's no middle ground, no indifference. So is there love some people who sin? Well, yeah, Jesus said there is. But how can we understand it? Have you ever worried about it? Have you ever been one of those people that go, oh no, I've never committed that sin, I've done that? Let's understand it. It's important we get our heads around it. What does it mean? Alright, what does it mean? Well, let's look at the context of this gift, because this is really important. When you're reading the Bible, You've got to look at the context, not just take a few words and go, oh, what's that? Right, look at the context. Verse 30, Jesus kind of finishes this little passage. He says, Jesus said this because the experts in Moses' teachings had said that he had need of the Spirit. So why did Jesus say there's another few people who sin? He's talking about something those teachers of the law were doing, were saying, and he then said what he said. And what did they say? Well, let's look at verse 22. That's the crux of it. The experts in Moses' teachings who had come from Jerusalem said, the elves of our him. And he forced his demons out of people with the help of a ruler of demons. So that is what has been said. They said that. They said that Jesus is possessed by the ruler of demons, the elves of That's what they were saying. See, rather than acknowledging Jesus' source of power, it coming from the Holy Spirit and from God, they have said it comes from Satan. And do you know what? That seems lovely to me too. Now, Jesus doesn't say directly those Jesus, Jerusalem experts have committed it. He's not saying they have. Right? We don't know whether they have or not. But what they were doing is they were observing the work of Jesus, healing people, setting people free from demonic oppression, and they assigned it to the work of Jesus. That's what they were doing. I think they were on the edge of falling into that system of actually assigning the work of God to be used. But do you know what? The verse before. Probably the most famous verse in this passage. I can guarantee you that people will be forgiven for any sin. Jesus doesn't give an exception here, does he? He doesn't say any sin or, or curse as long as you don't do this or that. He's just saying you, you can be forgiven from anything. So, how do verse 28 and 29 work together? How do they work together, these two verses? Any sin, all sin, can be forgiven. Can be forgiven. If the person repents. If the person changes the way they think and act. If they are talking about what they're turning from my own way, I'm turning to Jesus. If you do that, any sin can be forgiven. Yeah, thank you. It is good news. It's amazing news. Anything can be forgiven. But verse 29 shows us that, you know what? If we sin in saying that the work of God is actually of evil, we stop ourselves being able to respond to the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts us to realise we need to repent. It's the Holy Spirit that changes us and works on our heart and makes us go, oh, I need Jesus. And if we go, that's the work of the devil, work of evil, and we resist the work of the Holy Spirit, we'll never be able to respond to the forgiving love of Jesus. We can't do it. It's not possible. You know, we can blaspheme against Father God. Did you know that? And there's still hope. We can even sin against Jesus. And there is hope. They don't put us beyond sins. That doesn't put us beyond forgiveness. But when we blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, it does. And I think it's because of the unique 
and the decisive role the Holy Spirit plays in our salvation. If we look to God the Father and then turn from his glory to embrace sin, that's pretty bad. It's not good, is it? If we, if we uh, look at the Son, Jesus, whom God sent in the world to save us, and then we turn away from him, that's not good either. But in both those cases, in both those moments, I can turn from what the Father is doing, I can turn away from Jesus, but in both those moments, there is still hope. Because the Father has planned redemption, and Jesus has fulfilled it on the cross and in his resurrection, and the wonderful redemption comes because of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. It's this unique, special role the Holy Spirit has that applies the Father's plan to save us, right, and works out what Jesus accomplished on the cross. But if behind the Father and the Son we taste the work of the Holy Spirit and reject it, and reject it, So how should we do it? But this is not working through the Bible, we can't do any verses. Alright, that's why we do it. Because actually it's only just a preacher to look at the people who do it. But sometimes we need to teach people that these challenges are things. Yeah, we need to tackle it. We need to really understand what's going on. So how do we do in knowledge of this? Well, let me tell you this. When you experience the convicting work of the Holy Spirit in your life, don't reject it. Don't reject it. Don't reject his moving. Don't treat his loving work as if it's the work of the evil. Recognise that the Spirit of God working in your life prompts you to repent. Prompts you to receive the forgiveness of God. And this offer of grace is available to all who repent and believe. It's for everybody. Right? Verse 28 tells us, I can guarantee this truth. That's not me saying it, that's Jesus. Jesus is saying, he guarantees this is truth. What is truth? People will be forgiven for any sin or curse. It is good news. It is wonderful news. Please don't leave here today thinking, oh, I'm already learning. Alright? The fact that you're even thinking about it probably tells you that you're aware of the Holy Spirit working in your life. You're already understanding God's love for you. But I want to urge you in the name of Jesus. If by God's grace you repent today of your sin, do it today. If tomorrow you entertain sin and the Holy Spirit quickens your spirit, it quickens your spirit right, towards repentance, then act. Don't leave it. Act on it. Invite the Holy Spirit to be your ever present friend. Learn to follow his leading on the to flee from sin. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to forgiveness. And allow the good news that Jesus has forgiven you to lead you to be a forgiven That's what they're to do. And I just felt, for some of us, there's an awareness that we don't always truly believe that Jesus has forgiven us. We look back at some of the stuff that we've done. We go, how can you forgive me? What do we say? We forgive of any sin. Alright? There is nothing. If you're feeling the Holy Spirit working in your life and you're turning to Jesus and repenting of it, you can know his forgiveness today. Even for that deep, dark sin that you have never shared with him. He forgives you. He loves you. He's embraced, right? A father who would have the son, and the son comes back. It wasn't come back and come and be my slave. It was come back, and here's the rope, and here's the ring, and here's the shoes. But come on, you are accepted and loved. You are embraced by the father. He has forgiven you for everything you've done. If you allow his Holy Spirit to be in your life. There's no doubt about it. 
The whole of the story of the Bible tells us, demonstrates it, shows it. All right, just think of Paul, the Apostle Paul. What he did is killing Christians. And God comes and takes him, and he turns, and he repents of all that, and gets restored. And he talks about the love of God in the He knows the grace of God. You too can be assured that the name of Jesus loves you. And I felt that there are others that as we've been talking about forgiveness, yes, it's hard. Yes, it takes time sometimes. It does take time. But actually, there are situations and relationships in your life that you need to forgive. Alright? There are situations. And, and I'm not saying this, I'm just reading the words of Bible. Matthew, Jesus says, okay, the Lord's Prayer, you probably know what it says. If I choose not to forgive, the Father says, you don't, don't, you don't need to forgive. I get it. It says it. All right? And I just want to say to you, if there's unforgiveness in your heart, I will thank you. It may be, he's going to speak to you, it may be, but actually it's not always the case. Especially when they don't know how to you. Your relationship is so far distant, they don't know where you live anymore. You know what? You don't have to go back. You can go back to your Father in heaven. God, I choose to forgive you. I choose to see the change that bound you to this situation of grace and mercy. David, I don't know what some of you've got that you can see us in there, but I think it's good just to give us some time. We've got time. Alright? No forgiveness of God. If you're one of those people that keep doubting it, alright, because of shame and fear about what you've done, I want you to realise God loves you and forgives you. Just tell her to and I'll forgive you. Right? And if you know you're not forgiven, again, use this moment just to bring it to God and say, God, I'm choosing. It hurts, it's hard, what they did to me was awful, but I'm choosing 